How you guys doing today? Thought I'd take a minute to uh, talk about some video editing, right? When's the last time we did this? Actually, it was only a week ago. One of the things I've been trying to do <clears throat> is see if I can do this more often. A lot of people have said to me in the comments section like, oh, I missed your live stream. You're always streaming and I don't know when it's happening. So I'm trying to get this into a more um, like sort of a weekly thing where we can sit and talk a bit instead of having super, super long live streams. They can be shorter and you guys can come kind of know when I'll, I'll be around if you want to come ask me very specific questions. Because there's some questions I get asked in comments that are it's just really hard to answer a question in comments that's um, that's like you need to show somebody something. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to get through my coffee here. Let's see what I can do. There's some already got some great questions coming in. Um, I've been kind of perusing the chat, which is, uh, we got some uh, very good familiar faces in here. Architectural Sheet Metal, good to see you, my friend. Mr. Paul Peck, Mr. Paul Peck in the house, always good to see you, Mr. Paul Peck. Iggy from This Bites for you. How you doing, pal? Um, yeah, we uh, we got things moving here. So um, one of the questions that was already popping up repeatedly was talking about, asking about color grading. And I did do one live stream quite a while back now where I talked about color grading um, and I guess I probably didn't haven't talked about it in a while in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's take a second and talk about it. Let me ask you this guy, this question really quickly from everybody that's in the chat. Um, what kind of, uh, what video editing software are you guys mostly using? So I can get a feel for what's, what's happening out there. What you guys are using. Are you, uh, Adobe users, Filmora users, uh, Movavi users, DaVinci Resolve users, get an idea what's going on out there. Um, because, uh, you know, sometimes, I, a lot of the times I'll talk about Filmora or Movavi because those are the two that I use the most. Um, I'm, always, um, I'm always interested in seeing what everybody else is using because everybody uses different things. So we got uh, Premiere. Uh, DIY Buddies uh, uses Premiere and Filmora. Um, Condang Book, uh, Hooks uh, uses uh, Filmora. Uh, Je let's see. Filmora. Let's see. Go, go on Filmora. <laughs> we got a lot of Filmora. <clears throat> what do you think of Filmora X? I think it's great. I think it's a solid software. I think the updates they put into X10, I call it X, the X is supposed to mean 10. I think the updates they put into 10 are really great. I like the, especially the keyframing, the motion tracking. I thought those were huge updates. Um, the only thing that's uh, that's a little bit um, you know, worrisome is they changed the licensing structure. So we'll see how that works out um, You know, moving forward if it's going to be um, I, I think, I, you know, how long before they put Filmora 11 out? Cause I don't think the new licenses apply to it. So I, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm interested to see how they change the licensing as it moves forward. But I noticed that, <clears throat> excuse me. I noticed that they mentioned that in the website and the licensing that they no longer are selling licenses that last forever. They just last through the current version and all the updates in the current version. So we'll see. We shall see. Uh, I wonder if mine's still, uh, if still is still gonna because I might be grandfathered. I don't know. We'll find out because I bought mine so long ago back at Filmora seven or eight. Uh, I switched from Filmora to uh, Adobe After Effects. Great software since it kind of has more options in Filmora. Yep. Uh, but one thing is that Filmora is so easy to use. Yeah, that's the you nailed it right, Dad. Uh, bad dude gaming. <clears throat> we talked about this recently. I had my pal um, Jay Lipman, who is a uh, DaVinci Resolve user, which is a pretty high end software. And it's the same kind of thing. It's like some of these other higher end softwares offer a lot more. Um, they have more features to use, but they're also more expensive. You got to have a higher end computer to run them. Um, they, they have a much steeper learning curve. It's not like you just dive right in and it just, people get used to feel more where you push a button and it does something. Some of the higher end ones, you really have to learn how to do, how to create transitions, how to create, you know, the things you want to have happen. It's not just, Hey, drag drop. I want that crazy transition. I just bring it to my timeline. A lot of them aren't like that. Let me just take a quick peek at the chat. Uh, Tim Simpson says, uh, Daniel Battelle, that's why I stick with Final Cut Pro and Resolve because I don't really want to get stuck in yet another subscription. Yeah, I hear you. Um, uh, I think Final Cut Pro and both Dissolve that you purchase them and that's it. Final Cut Pro is a great software. It's Mac only, uh, but if you're a Mac user, if you're someone who started like on iMovie and you're thinking about what should be the next software, Final Cut Pro is a great um, step from iMovie because it, it's very high functioning uh, and it's Mac based, so it, it feels familiar, you know. Uh, how can you make a PNG um, pick in Filmora 10? Quit, uh, just so we understand here, I get this kind of question a lot. A PNG picture, and I know what you're asking. You're asking me, how do I create a transparent background, right? I think that's what you're asking. What you really want to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still waking up, still drinking coffee. 
Um, PNG images are not inherently transparent. They support transparency. But just because an image is saved as a PNG, like my thumbnails I can save as a PNG. A lot of times I do and there's no transparency. I'm not using transparency. But a PNG supports transparency, meaning if you have layers in there and not a solid background, it'll leave the transparency in the image so you can lay it over um, in using it in Filmora. Right now, Filmora does not support any exporting of any type with transparency. Anything you save, it's going to automatically put a black background into it, even if it's you're just doing like a you put titles on screen, some text. So currently, it's one of those things that um, that I hope that they do in the not too distant future, because it'd be nice to be able to do things like make stream overlays and things like that with Filmora, you know, that would have transparency behind them. Currently, you can't. Um, is there a way to dynamic link between Filmora and Premiere Premier Pro? I'm not sure what you mean by dynamic link. Like the, the, the thing about um, Adobe you have to understand is Adobe is a lot like Apple. They have their own ecosystem. So if you get into Adobe, Adobe doesn't want to link to any other software other than other Adobe, prod Adobe products. They want to link to After Effects. They want to link to Illustrator. They want to link to Photoshop. So you can't really have them work in unison or, or integrate them. And that's intentional. <laughs> Adobe does that intentionally uh, because they want it. Um, they want it to. They want you to stay in their product line, buy their stuff, right? Uh, watching from the Philippines. Good to see you, my friend Jeffrey. Nice to have you here, pal. Um, is that apps that rule? I see Mr. Doug Houston in the house. Doug, always a pleasure to see you. But I think I saw apps that rule. So that's my friend Joe. Joe, good to see you, pal. If you're out there, there he is. Uh, best coffee to drink when editing. <clears throat> best coffee to drink when editing. Right now, I'm drinking. This is um, Death Wish coffee. Have you heard of this one? It's like, it's high octane coffee. It'll, it'll knock you, it'll curl your hair. <laughs> but it's very good. That's the one I use. I can only drink like one of these though, Joe. And then I'm, I'm done. I have to go to like regular coffee because it's super powerful. Uh, have I used Filmora Pro? Yeah, I have. I've done a couple of videos on it on my channel, some tutorials, just walking through it. I do have a Filmora Pro license. I don't use it as much. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. When something's simple and does what I need it to do, like I don't need the fanciest thing out there. I need the thing to do what I that I want to do, and I wanted to do it fairly easily. Um, so Pro has a lot more features, but it's an entirely different video editing software than Film the regular Filmora line. And it just they they just happened to name it Filmora Pro, and they leveraged the name that people knew Filmora, so they went, oh, we'll call it. Pro, but it's a completely different software. It has not, it's nothing like Filmora 10 um, or any of the Filmores that came before it, 9, 8, 7. Totally different, totally different layout. A lot more features, um, not all the easy drag and drop stuff, some of it, uh, but not all the drag and drop that were ease of workflow stuff that we're used to in 10. But they both have free trials that have watermark on export. So you can go ahead and download it and try it and go like, well, it's all the functions work. You just can't export without a watermark. You need to buy a license um, for both the, for any of the Filmora products for, to export without a watermark. But you can download it and play with it and go, do, do I want to buy a license? Do I like this? So that's kind of cool. Let me see what I got uh, sitting here. Uh, hey, Daniel, I have a bad PC, PC, 8 gigs of RAM, i3 9th gen, uh, a GT710. I want to make good edits and I want good effects. Uh, is Magic Vegas good or should I use something better? Uh, 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 Vegas, is, Vegas was a Sony product. Uh, who owns Vegas? No, it's Magic Vegas, right? It's good product. It, here's the thing. <clears throat> One of the biggest mistakes that creators make is they think – there's this, just because I can put software on my computer, it'll run. And unfortunately, that's not the case. All of these different softwares have minimum system requirements. And I would never run Filmora at the minimum system requirements, like an i3 and the, some of their lowest, you know, um, in, you know built-in graphics. Um, I would never, it would fall apart on me because it, it'll, it'll physically turn on and the features will show up. But if you try to create more than a couple tracks, it just falls apart because it's not designed. That's just minimum. That's like just to get it to turn on and, say, you know, to boot up. Uh, I always recommend if you're going to invest in anything, invest in improving your, your um, computer. Get a decent um, get a decent um, CPU, a different a decent uh, GPU, and then get a decent amount of RAM. I, I personally can't edit with, I edit, I won't edit with anything less than 32, but that's me. I get pretty heavy into the, I want things to move pretty quickly. But 16 will get you there. If you start, I would say a minimum of 16 gigabytes of RAM. 
Um, you want something, if you can get into like an i5, i7, somewhere around that, or a Ryzen 7, you'll start seeing some better results. If you can get into something that's a, <clears throat> like a 20 series NVIDIA, like the NVIDIA 2060 series or higher, you'll start seeing some better you can do it with a 1650, but the 20 series, they run smoother. The new 30 series, we can't get our hands on. Um, or if you're using um, if you're using Ryzen, I, there's a lot of decent Ryzen cards out there. I'm using the new, um, they're hard to get to, but I'm using the new 6800 XT, which runs really smoothly. I really like it. Um, let me roll through. So some of the things that uh, I've been asked about here today with the color grading, I want to talk about... Um, Color grading really quickly, all right? Is you guys interested in that? Um, Filmora users, there's enough Filmora users here. Let me quickly show you some things um, that have to do with color grading that can that might make some sense. It's pretty basic stuff. Let me push some screens around here. Um, I will share my screen. Let me share my screen from over here. There we go. Bring this up. Um, let me make sure I'm watching. Uh, let me see all these. Watching from Pakistan. Uh, Abdullah Khan, hey, I'm glad to have you here, my friend. Um, yeah, so let me see. Uh, let me add this to the stream. So here is, here's Filmora, right? And this is just some footage um, that I filmed here in the studio. Clearly, it was a little, this was a while back because I've added like candles and a couple things since then. So the lighting's a little bit different. Uh, but that's kind of like where my set was at that point. Um, and let me get this full screen so you can see what I'm doing here and let me get rid of the task bar so you don't have to look at the task bar. Uh, okay, cool. Um, uh, boom and full screen. There we go. Um, and I can get rid of that brand overlay too. So you don't have to see that one second. Sorry. I've just got, you know, I'm trying to be so cool. <laughs> it's not I'm just covering up the screen with my graphics. So here's Filmora, uh, Filmora 10. Um, and here's a piece of footage that's not color graded or anything. This is straight from my camera. I've got my camera set, so I try to get a decent image out of it. Um, but let me see. If I scroll forward to, you'll see I always start my footage. I recommend you guys do this. Um, using a white balance card. You see how I have that card? That's just a little flop out card. That's a, It's specifically designed for doing white balance, and you can do gray balance too. If you see, I'll, I'll flip the card to the other side, and it'll give me the... Um, It'll give me the gray target zone. So um, that's really important to do that because what it does, the very first thing you want to do when we talk about color grading is you want to, if you don't know what white balance is, is you want to make sure that the, the, color, the basic color spectrum of your video is balanced so that the colors are true. Like the amount of basic, you know, the amount of white in it isn't lean too tinted too far to the left or too far to the right from the camera or the phone you were using. So having a white balance card is super helpful. That one right there, I have a video on how to use these. If you look up White Balance Filmora on my channel, you'll see, I show you exactly how to use this and I even have a link to where to buy these. They're like $10 US, they're not expensive at all. Um, but they, and they fold up, they're nice and easy. I keep it in my kit. But if you're doing this, right, if you click on your footage, um, you'll see in the upper left that you have your, um, your options for that video segment. There's the video tab, the audio tab, and then the color tab. And in the color tab, you'll see there's a drop down menu right here for white balance. And see that little eyedropper? If you grab that, see how it becomes a click mark and it's sort of, it's grabbing every color that I, I cross over. See it, it's looking for whatever color. So I'm trying to tell the software what white is. So it has a reference point of what all the other colors are. And that's why you wanna use a true white balance card. So I find the whitest part of that card where the light is hitting it hopefully near my face and I click on it and you see what it did up here? It adjusted the temperature up and it adjusted the tint down because it wasn't quite true. It's trying to balance and get the white balance of this correct, right? You see what happened there? Um, and I can turn it off a little bit and on. It's not a huge difference. It just corrects it and starts you at a level level playing field. You know, it, and sometimes it's a dramatic difference, to, difference depending how far your footage is off. But I do it. I try to get my balance in my studio pretty close. You can see the temperature was, you know, a little bit cold. So it warmed it up a bit. But once you get into here, right? So here's your basic footage. You can go into the advanced tab right down underneath there. Click on the advanced tab and it'll open up um, this window. And this is your advanced color correction window. Um, now it starts with a bunch of presets that you could just click on and it just does, it's almost, it's, these are all just LUTs, which are lookup tables um, that you could just, you know, add a certain look to your footage. But I always go into the adjust tab 
And this is where you really start learning what's going on with your footage, true, you know, truly. You can look at the histogram to get an idea of the red, green, and blue bal balance. I'm a little heavy on the red because I'm using red background lights. I'm getting that orange glow. Um, so it's picking that up more, obviously. Um, but you can go down and you can say, all right, what do I want to do? Do I want to enhance the color? I usually don't do most of that stuff. I kind of leave that alone. I come down to the color tab first, usually. And I'll say, let me do this. I usually, for, for YouTube, I'll bring the contrast up a little bit because you can see how you don't want it to get black, but I don't want it to be washed out. So I usually dial it up just a hair, get a little more contrast. It gives it a little more a little more pop to it. It makes some of the darker, dark areas a little more solid. And I usually pop up the saturation, which is just the overall colors. If I pulled it back, see how it gets really muted. And if I crank it, it's over the top. So I usually push it just a little bit. A very simple thing I tend to do is push the contrast a little, push the saturation a little, to, just for my set. For this particular shot, just to, just to make it pop a little. Um, and then the next thing I'll do is I'll go into the light settings. Now the light settings are basically, you're controlling the four different um, light spectrum areas of your footage. There's the highlights. If I grab that, you'll see this will just grab the whitest of the whites. Like, see that center guitar, that, that pickup is reflecting really bright. This is just, that'll blow all those super highs up and down. So it's just the whitest of the whites. So if you feel like, it's not quite a brightness switch, but that's what it is, it's the, the whitest of the white. Um, so I'll, that's a lot of times what I'll do is I'll advance the footage and find a spot where I'm on screen. Let's get the goofiest face we can. Uh, that's kind of goofy. Uh, well, I want goofy. That, nah, it's so hard. That's kind of goofy. <laughs> this, I usually, no matter where I stop, I'm making the goofiest face. It's like, he's about to sneeze. Wait, uh, now he's counting. Daniel's learning to count. And now it's like, geez, did I just fart? So you never know what's happening on screen with these faces. But what you could do here is, um, the, let me get back on track. <laughs> the highlights, if I think that, um, that I, you know, like the, the top end, the whitest of the whites need to get popped a bit, um, then I'll push that up a bit. The shadows are just physically that. They're the, sort of the mid-low tones. You can see if I pull it way back and I bring it up, you see it's it's the it's not the darkest of the darks. It's the shadowed area. I can pull it back so that if you look on the outside around the edges where like the peace sign and the mobile gas is, if I want to kind of pull some of those shadows back so they're a little more muted, I can drop the shadows back. And I can also bring it up if I think the whole thing needs to be brightened. But I tend to, you know, I don't tend to move those a lot. Maybe down a hair. Uh, if you're going to bring the highlights up, maybe bring the shadows down a touch. Now the whites is just your overall white balance, the brighter the bright, right? Like if I if I feel I'm a little washed out, I can pull the whites back. Or if I feel like I'm a little too color corrected, like I feel a little orangey, I can bring the whites back up a touch. They're not too bad where they are. Uh, and then the blacks are the darkest of the dark, right? So you can see if I pull the blacks way down, it's super dark. And then if I bring it back up, it's the darkest of the dark. Sometimes like if I notice <clears throat> I'm wearing a shirt and you can't see a single wrinkle in it and I want it to have a little definition, I'll go, let me bring the blacks up just a touch so some of the blacks show up, okay? The next below that is called the HSL, um, and that's the, the hue, saturation, and luminosity. And what this really is, is it starts looking at your, at your piece of footage by individual colors, okay? So like right now I'm on red, so if I pulled the saturation out of just the red, everything in here that's red would start to get yanked out. Like see my Coke sign, it now looks green, I pulled all the red out. My skin gets pale, my lips look like I am dead. Wow, look at those blue lips. Um, but this is like, if I feel like things are a little too red, my skin tone is too red, I might pull back the saturation on the red a touch. I may have brought the overall color up, but maybe that made the reds pop too much, so I'll dial them back a hair. Um, you can also, up top, you can change which red, right? You can take the red, look at my background lights. If I push them more towards purple, I can switch the hue of just the reds to more of a purple, or I can bring them back up towards more of an orange. Just keep in mind that it's also gonna change the color and things like your skin tone. So I'm always watching clear my face first. I wanna see, look at that, look at that look. He looks like he's staring at me. Heck, that, what's his problem? Dude, what are you looking at? <laughs> so, but I, yeah, I try to watch my skin tone because I think that's the most important thing is try to get your skin tone to look pretty good. But you can go through each one of these colors independently and decide to go, all right, you know, I, I want to bring up some of the oranges in my, in my skin and then the wood so I can bring the saturation up a bit and I can maybe change the color. Be careful. Look around the left guitar. 
See this guitar right here? Can you see that reflection? You gotta be careful. If you start seeing artifacts, you know that you've pushed things too hard. Most of these little tweaks should be just slight corrections. You don't wanna pick up um, artifacts. Luminescence is sort of like the brightness um, of that individual color. So if you wanna bring, if you wanna make that one color pop a little bit more. But you can do that with, with each color. Like I've got a little bluish green above my head. If I want, if I had a blue background and I really wanted the blue to pop, I can like bring the blue up, find that hue of blue. See the neck of the guitar on top of my head, right up, right up here. If you watch, I'll change that blue light and I'll make it more light blue, more into the purple. So, you, so it's just grabbing the blue. Can you see that up at the very top? So I'm just affecting that single color. And I try not to make drastic changes. I'll usually be like, yeah, there's some blue back there. I want it to pop a little more. I'll bring it up a hair. Um, and the last thing that we have in these options is a vignette. And a vignette is basically like a, uh, it's your ability to create almost like a frame, a softened frame. And, and let me, the easiest way to, to tell you what it is is show you. I'm gonna take this and I'll, you can go either dark or light. So look at the very edges. See how that's dark? I'm gonna get, this is feathered right now. I'm gonna take the feather right out of it. So it's like a circle. Think about adding a circle, either a dark circle or a light circle, right? So you're taking everything around that circle and either making it darker or lighter. Now you go like, why would you do this? That looks like a mask. But what the reason you use this is, if you really wanna draw focus to something in the center, what I'll do is I'll put a little vignette on it. I'll bring the feather up, right? See how that feather's off so it's not that harsh line? So get a little feather to it. Um, uh, you can change the highlight and exposure in there too if you want, so you can get it brighter or darker over all the, the effects of that feather layer. Um, and you can bring up the highlight and bring down the highlight of just that feather. If you look in the very, like the lower left corner, you'll see that brighten up and you'll see it darken up. I tend not to move that too much. I tend to go, all right, let me get this where I want it. I'll change, you can change the size of that. See, I can shrink it in more, get it real small. But I can go, maybe I just really wanna draw attention to me and I want the other stuff to disappear a bit. I'll bring that in. Um, and then I'll just, uh, you can affect the shape of it too. Let me show you so that you can see without the feather. So then the, the roundness just changes the shape. Do you want it more round or more oval? I tend to like oval, bring that, um, that feather back up. And all it does is if you use it effectively, um, this is with that on, see how it, you can't really see it. It just seems like the outside is a little darker. So it's taken my frame and brought the focus back onto me. If I turn the vignette off, you see how it brightens back up? That just sort of creates that effect. So it's like, how much do I want? Probably not over the top. That might be a little too much. But okay, there's on, there's with it off, and there's with the vignette on. So it's just a, it's just when we talk about these color corrections, that's really what we're talking about is um, creating that ability to um, take your footage to uh, another level of really correcting the color so that it looks right. Um, I get really anal with it. I actually have a um, <clears throat> one of the spider monitor calibrators that hangs from my monitors and it goes through a whole series of calibrations to make sure that my monitor is showing me the right colors that the reds i'm seeing are the right reds and i'm pretty nuts about it because i I'm, i love video editing so i try to get the bright you know i get my monitors um, balanced as well first so that whatever i see is you know i'm using my eyes so i want to make sure that what my eyes are showing me if I bring up the reds, is it really need more reds or is that the, the monitor is, is just doesn't have a lot of reds in it? And then I end up putting it on YouTube and it's like blown out because the colors don't match. I was like, oh, on my screen, it looked great. Well, your screen, my screen wasn't calibrated and then it, it was telling me the wrong information. So calibrating your screen is important if you can do it. Those tools, those tools usually run, um, they use, I think I get some of them on sale. You can usually get one for uh, like $150 for an entry level screen calibrator that works pretty good. Um, but yeah, oh, and when once you're done with it, once you're done and you have this all done, you can, there's a couple other things in the upper right, see this little window here? You can do a side-by-side -side view and compare um, before and after just to see what your adjustments did. And this is a very subtle difference. You know, if you look at this, you go, well, it doesn't look too different. But my my face pops a little bit better. If you look around the edges, it's a little bit darker. Um, the reds are a little bit more red. It just gave it a, there's a little more hue. So all I did was just that slight thing. I try to get most of it done right to begin with. I'm not trying to do major adjustments unless I'm trying to add a lot. If I want like a serious adjustment, I will go with adding a lot. And you can do that up um, right over here in the 3D LUTs where you can bring in like, oh, I wanna do a, um, they, like see some of the, the preloaded ones, like I'll add gravity. 
Now, see the heavy change that made? It gave it a totally colder look. My skin looks colder. I lost a lot of the warmth. It's a darker look. Um, you could. These are all Lutzer lookup tables. They're just a set of preset instructions. Um, here's one that says House of Cards. It sort of softens things up. Uh, here's one that's Game of Thrones. Does a similar darker thing. Um, Star Wars gives it more of a vintage look. Walking Dead kind of grains it up a bit too. It just gets kind of that, like that Walking Dead color um, look. Cyberpunk. Oh, look at me. Look at me glowing. <laughs> you know, you pick the ones you like. Um, I have a few that I've actually built myself that, you know, custom LUTs that I use. But in general, I tend to do just my color correction. Uh, unless I'm trying to do something like I'm really trying to make like a dramatic look, I might go um, certain things like either a, uh, a cool film, like if I want it really like a blue look. <clears throat> um, because I have so many colors in this shot, it doesn't work. But if I was doing something like filming water or something, um, I did this with a with a cinematic thing I had showed and how to do create cinematic. Uh, I did like a cool film or a gravity overlay and that and that made the water go from clear to more of a bluish water and it really helped it out. But in general, it's sort of like using your eye and know what you're looking for. Um, and then once you're done, you can either just hit, hit OK. If you really love it, what you've done, like if I know I'm going to be back on my set a lot, I can save this as a preset and then put whatever I can call it, like, you know, Daniel's um, set and I can save it and it will be there for future projects when I come back, which will be under the preset tab in the upper left, all presets, go to custom. There's Daniel's set down here, right? Right. That's I just saved it. So anything else I come back to later on, another piece of footage, I can always go, oh, let me just add the Daniel set to it and and then I'm done. Um, and then yeah, once you're done, you can just hit OK and, and then you're kind of done, right? You probably saw a little bit of change there. So it just it's just one of those things you do to that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about color grading is we're trying to get our footage to look the best it can look. Um, and there are different softwares that do it better than others. DaVinci probably has the best color grading out, out there because it was um, designed as a color grading tool before it ever was a video editing software. So it's got very good color correction. Um, but a lot of this, I try to tell people, the, the most amount of correction you can do when you're filming, the production end of it, is incredibly important. If you can get the lighting right, if you can get the set right, then you don't have to try, then you're not trying to correct something that's really miserable to start with. That's really like, oh, it looks horrible. I have to do all this stuff to try to make it look better. Um, like in here, I've got more lights going on than I know what to do with. Like I have candles behind me, right? They're on a remote. Let those those all turn off. I've got um, I've got a big key light right here. That's my main light, right? So that goes off. Those are all separately lit back there. The each individual piece, I actually they're on a trigger back there. My background lights, right? My background lights, like the red ones, those are here. That's all triggered. I've that's all run from my phone. These are all different phone apps that run them. My side fill light and my blue light, those are also run by my phone. I can turn those off actually at the same time. You can just start to see how it gets darker and darker and darker. Uh, I have another light up top that sort of just has a glow. Um, that sort of throws down. That's this one. See where we're going here? <laughs> now, now it's just like the glow of my screens that are uh, that are doing it. But all these layers of light. So right. So here's my here's my subtle room fill light. It's very subtle. Boom. It just slightly brings up the room, right? Uh, and then I have my again my my actually my light behind me. I didn't turn off, but that that blue one back there is. Uh, let me go for fixtures. Um, I can turn those on and off. That's my backlight and my keep my side fill light. There's a key light. There's so many lights. It, it, but it's that kind of thing that I took a long time designing this set so that it would have a certain look. Um, and it would be, let me see, what do we forget? See, I have a whole checklist. Like, don't forget to turn your candles on. Don't forget you turn your Route 66 sign on. Um, so there's all these little things that I try to build so that the set has a certain look, like the way I put the kind of lights where I put them. Um, to try to make them look a certain way. If you can do a lot of that while you're while you're filming your shot, then by the time you get into your 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 software, everything should be kind of balanced because you've gotten you've you've purchased decent lights, or you know, or if you're filming in daylight, daylight is always like the the most natural light there is, right? So if you do a lot of outside shots, you don't want to do it in direct sunlight. That's another mistake I see a lot of people do. They're filming and it's in bright sunlight. You you know, it's actually better to do it in like a slightly cloudy day or at the end of the day when the sun's going down a bit, when it's not blowing out the whites on everything. 
Um, but, or if you're in your house and you're right by a window and you got a lot of nice natural light that can help, but that's in color correction. That's what we're doing. We're trying to make adjustments, but I wouldn't want, like if I was trying to color correct this and I thought there was too much red in my shot, um, I, I would try to solve it first here. I would say, oh, you know what? Why don't I see if I can take the red back in my lights here on my set? Like, is that, is that too much red? Now it's all like, now it, I'm in hell. This looks like fire, <laughs> right? So I'm like, how much red is the right amount of red? for my set and I'm always tweaking and balancing and wondering, you know, is it red or should it be blue or, you know, what's the right color? Is it, should it be kind of more of a greenish, you know, what, what am I, maybe, uh, maybe, 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 maybe purple is a little, <laughs> so it's always a matter of trying to figure out what you what you want your, your shot to look like because I do a lot of stuff on set. That's why you, you know, I, I spent a lot of time and effort here. Um, to get this stuff correct. So think about that color correction. That's really what it comes down to is you're thinking about, um, how, how you can get your shot to look correct. So it looks, looks the way, and I shouldn't even say correct. I have to be careful here because sometimes you're going for a specific dramatic effect. And that might mean that you're shifting all the color patterns a certain way to get that dramatic look. You know, you, you want, you, you filmed something that was outdoors and like, um, mountains and you really want all the greens to pop. So you might use the HSL green to bring a lot of the greens up in your shot and bring maybe some of the blues in the sky up, right? So those individual colors kind of pop more. So color correction and color grading is really about making sure that your basic footage, which you spent a lot of time getting, you know, shot and look right. You take a, it's like that coat of polish, that gloss where you go, I'm really going to take this to the next level. Does that make sense? Does that make sense you guys out there? Um, Really sort of important things to learn. I think a lot of times people get into video editing software and they get overwhelmed um, with just, I just want to learn a cool trick, you know, but one of the biggest things that you can, um, that you can do is, um, is learn how to actually, you know, shoot great footage. Um, that's probably the most important thing out there. A uh, question from Deo Ray Alive. Uh, is there a free app so I can move the background that will help me a lot? A free app that can remove the background from a picture or video? Um, that's another common question I get. I'm, ge I'm, I'm guessing you mean video. Is that what you, you're asking me, Deo Rail? Um, if it's video, there might be a few apps that do that, that, that crop you out. Um, in video editing software, it's very difficult to do because you have to, it's called rotoscoping. You basically have to trace the person, you know, it'll do a little bit of it, you know, to, to, um, to pro, you can get like a Da Vinci or Adobe does a little bit of that, not automatically. You have to set the whole trace and then every few frames you have to adjust it. It's a very hard process. So if you're looking to remove a background, you know, I would probably, uh, I'd probably try to, you know, first of all, I'd ask you why you're doing that. Is it, is it something you're doing every video? Like every video your, is your content. You're always putting yourself in different situations. Get one of the advanced editing softwares that does that, that has those features and to learn it. And it's a very, Difficult technique that when it's done right, um, it looks great, but it takes a lot of effort. And I've said this before, there's a reason if you've ever seen like when behind the scenes when they film Star Wars or, or when they film like the Marvel movies, you always see those guys in sets that are all green. You know, there's a reason they don't just film it like on the streets and then remove everything in the background and put those guys into something else because it's impossible to make things look good that way. You really want a controlled set. You want one controlled background like a green that you can just pull the green out and then the green disappears instead of trying to rotoscope around every character. So if you're looking to put yourself in different scenes, I'd build yourself a green screen set. So what I would do is get a room in your house and paint one whole wall green or get a green, big green cloth and film yourself in front of that green. And then you can use a chroma key feature to remove that green, which is usually a neon green. The reason we use, it can be blue, like neon blue, but neon green is a color that doesn't occur in your skin or your eyes much. Um, so it's, or, you know, unless you're wearing it in your clothes, but that's one you can remove without worrying about parts of your, your skin tones getting removed. I did a whole video on um, how to do, you know, um, green screen tips and tricks that's on my channel, but that's the best way to do it. Instead of trying to remove a background, film in front of a green screen, then put yourself into whatever you want. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, some couple questions here, Daniel, you were talking about white balance, which is better to use balancing with a white card or gray card. It's a great question. Um, they, they do a similar thing, but I, I'm a white card guy. I use white card. The only time I use a gray card is if it, it, the gray card for me comes in handy when there's, when it's a, a scenario where a white is a very prominent color. Like if I'm, if I'd film something out snowboarding where there's a ton of white, 
I'll go, ugh, the minute I try to white balance to white, there's so much white, it's, it's almost blown out. So I'll use the gray card on a very white, bright outdoor beach scene or a or like a, a snowboarding scene, and it just helps get those grays, because grays is really more of your mid-tones, and you can use both. You can click the white and check how it looks, and then click the gray and check how it looks, and make adjustments, but all that it is, white is trying to find the overall white balance, gray is trying to balance the mid-tones. So it just depends on which works better for how you've shot your footage, uh, and which gets you closer to a neutral look that, that looks right to you. Um, great question, though, great question. I, but I always have one of those on hands, um, you know, but it's because I think it's uh, I think it's important. It's a really quick way to start from kind of a neutral place with your footage. Um, there's a bunch of questions in here. Let me see if I can ca- capture some of them here. Uh, right here, Daniel, how do you compare two videos side by side in the same frame for comparison? Video? How do you do? Oh, so, oh, for for YouTube? Like if you okay using Filmora? Is that what you're asking? You want to do a side by side? There's a couple of ways to do that. If you're using Filmora. Um, let me do this. Let me share the screen up here. You can, let me chop this in half and I'll show you what's going on. Let me do that. And let me put this up here. Um, as long as you have two tracks of video, see now I have one over the other. You can either do, you can either do this. And if anything you click in the upper right, you can now control that. See how I've now, see how when I click this track in the timeline, it not only brought up features in the upper left on it, right? If I click the lower one, these are now all the features that control that. But it also in the upper right preview window, see how it gets that dotted line with the green dots around it? So if you click on that, you can now grab the corner dot and you can shrink it, right? So you can go, oh, okay. And it gives you those nice green lines to go, that's the center. Okay, I wanna get that on center. Now let me turn this, let me lock that in place. See down in the timeline, it's got a lock button. So now when I click on screen again, it's only going to um, highlight the other piece of footage. And I can shrink that down. I can go, yeah, I know, you know, let me make it the exact same size as that one. And then let me move it. Let me get them lined up. See, the, see how the green lines show up? Um, I've got them locked. Let me unlock the other one now. And see how when I move them, see how you see the green lines show up? It's telling me it's at the same height as that one. Um, so I go, okay, something like this. So they're side by side. That's one way you can do it. You can also use the split screen. So here's another, let me show you this one. Um, let me get rid of the footage in my timeline really quickly. See how this is the split screen option. It's in the upper left, you'll see split screen. Grab one of the split screens, um, and I haven't used this in a while. Let me add this into here. It'll show up in the timeline here and in your preview window. This is where it gets confusing sometimes. Um, you can put a piece of footage Drag it, drag it right over to your preview window. So put one here. There's one piece of footage, and I only have one in my time in my. So, but then I'll put another one over here. It's the same one, um, but you can see, and you can click on each one, and you can change the size of them. That's another easier way to do it. Um, you can change um, a bunch of the uh, the settings in here too that allow you to do the uh, advanced split screen editing on the size and things like that. Um, but this is, you know, so if you click on each one that'll allow you to play with it, if you want it, whatever size you want to do it to and audio and ter- if you want to turn the volume off, so it's muted. Um, and that's how you can do it. That's a nice, simple way to do split screen and split screen has um, all these different options. So no matter like if you wanted a different split screen pattern, like with five, see this one down here. And if I brought that one over instead, I could add that if I said, all right, I want to do, let me double, let me see, that's the one that's what it looks like. Okay, let me add that. And then, you know, I could add five different pieces of footage. If I had them all up here in my import window, I'm going to put five different pieces of footage. But again, you can see like they're getting cropped differently. So you might go, oh, that crop is a little off. I want it to be more like, I only want it to be like that. There, there are some limitations. Obviously, you got to, you know, the more you split it up, the more it's going to be cropped. So that's the, that's the two ways um, to accomplish uh, creating sort of a split screen technique, however you want to do it. Um, you can do, you know, top, on top of each other. Uh, let me see. I'm just reading through some of these. Let me, let me catch up with some of the chat. Um, uh, did I miss a super chat? I'm sorry if I missed a super chat. It looks like, uh, uh, Shrek travel who super chat $5. I really appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. Um, let me see if I can find the comment. Did it already go past me? Uh, sometimes they go past so quickly. I can't find them again. Um, 
yeah, this is what happens when I talk too much, right? Yeah. But anyway, uh, Shrek, uh, Shrek Travel, thank you very much. Um, is almost monetized. Wanted to say thank you for all the support and education you provided. Start in December, in December with a clue. Hey, uh, that's awesome. You're almost, you're almost monetized. Fantastic. I love hearing that. Congratulations on almost getting monetized. Shrek Travels, uh, Shrek, tra- Shrek Travel. It's a, it's that's one of the. The first 100 subscribers was one of the hardest things to hit on YouTube. And then after that, that hitting 1,000 and getting monetized and getting 4,000 uh, watch hours was one of the hardest things. It just, it just felt like an uphill battle. Looking back, I'm like, wow, you know, man, that's, that's come such a long way. But it, that is, it is really hard, that, that beginning struggle. It does get easier as you keep going and you start building a community and you get better at doing the thing you do. People start understanding what it is, the kind of content you make. YouTube starts understanding the kind of content you make. Um, it gets easier. So congratulations. I'm looking a uh, 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 big thumbs up on almost monetized. Hopefully that happens soon. Um, let me see how many did I, I missed two super chats. Uh, there was also one from, uh, jock pop laser f- uh, 499. Thank you so much. Jock pop. Uh, I do have a question. How do you get your money for merch? You sell in Spreadshirt. Good question. Speaking of which, I want to take a quick second to mention Spreadshirt. They are uh, they are one of the um, companies that help sponsor these live streams. Uh, if you don't know what Spreadshop is, it is a um, it's a print on demand company that allows you to make. I think pinned at the top of the chat, you'll probably see some of my merch. It allows you to make T-shirts, mugs, uh, you name it. You can print any kind of merch that you want to make, uh, and it doesn't cost you anything. You set up a free so- a free shop. You you set up your designs, and then Spreadshop does all the heavy lifting if someone orders something they print it they ship it and then they split the profit with you so you can set the profit margin of how much you want to make and then that's kind of it you're kind of done at that point uh the question you were asking was how do you get um paid there's actually you integrate i'm going to do a video on this i got a couple more spread shop videos coming but you and uh, today we're talking video editing but i will cover that you can integrate in spread shop your bank account and it'll pay you directly it'll send it right via you know, right to your bank account. So you can set up how you want to get paid. Um, and you usually have to give your tax information and stuff like that, depending on which country you live in, um, just so that, you know, everything's taken care of. But it just, they just set it up, boom. And every time you sell something, they just send you a direct deposit. <clears throat> I don't think they do pay, do they do PayPal? I'm trying to remember if they do PayPal too. But I think it's mostly, I, I did mine direct to my bank. So whenever something comes, it's a direct, it gets sent right over. So it's just linking how you want that money sent. And I'll, I promise I'll cover that in an upcoming video. But if you haven't set up a Spreadshop account, uh, links down in the um, description below after this um, after this live stream, go click on that and set up a free shop and you can start having your own t-shirts, mugs, whatever you want to make, backpacks, camera bags, you name it, We we they got it. And you can also spread shop. Uh, spread shop actually um, integrates with the merch shelf on YouTube. That's why you're seeing under my videos and live streams, you'll see merch. So if you actually have the merch shelf, if you've reached the requirements, spread shop integrates right in YouTube and it, and they make it nice and easy. Plus they have, they own all their own printing locations and they have locations in, in, in both sides of the planet. They have some here out in us and then they have other ones out in Europe. So they, they, they ship globally. There's pretty much nowhere that they won't ship to. So I, that's why I love spread shop. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, that was the question. I think I got them both. Megan, thanks for staying on top of things and keeping me, uh, keeping me on point. Um, let me see. Uh, Cybercraft said, can you explain, explain bouncing while editing? When I add something to a track, do I have to re-edit the whole thing as a way to stop this? When I add something to a track, do I have to re-edit the whole thing? Um, bouncing is a term, if we're talking about the same thing, is a technique that I, we've talked about this on my last stream, live stream. Bouncing is just taking everything that's on in your project, sending it out and exporting it, turning it into one video file and bringing it back in so you can work some more without having to have all those things in your timeline. If they're set in stone and you go, yep, everything that's here, I'm not going to change. A lot of times if it starts slowing my computer down, I'll bounce it. I'll send everything out at a very high resolution, high bit rate and get it into one video file so I can bring in, I can start a new project. Um, with just that one file and all the text is on it, the color grading is done, the sound is taken care of, all of that stuff is done. And then I can start doing things like, oh, I want to add some other footage, like I'm doing different things back and forth. I want to add some screen capture. I want to add some B-roll. Uh, and I'll do that afterwards and add that in instead if I have too many things going on and I just want to make it easier on my computer. So that's what I, I think that's what you're asking about bouncing. Uh, and do you have to, the other question was, um, well, do you have was it? Do you have to render everything or re-edit the whole thing? No, you don't have to re-edit the whole thing. Um, you just bounce it out, send it out, and it's a really kind of a simple idea. If you just had a bunch of stuff on your timeline, I don't in this particular thing, but let's say I did, and let's say uh, you know, let's say I had. Let me 
Let's see, am I locked here? Uh, I had it here. Okay, I got to be done with this. So media back. If I have a bunch of tracks, you know, I'll just keep stacking stuff. Let's pretend these are all different things. And maybe I had titles, right? Maybe I had some titles going on in here. And I had all this stuff and it was like, well, I'm asking, you know, I had maybe 20, 30 tracks going on, but I had everything where I wanted it. I can just take that and I'll just export it. And when I say bounce, I mean, just send it out. I usually um, set it to a really high bit rate, usually 80,000 KBPS or higher. Um, usually, you know, make sure you got the right frame rate, um, the right resolution. Um, a lot of times I'll send it out at UHD, even if it's um, 1080, I'll put it out at UHD up at, you know, 3840 by 2160. Same with the audio. I make sure the audio is at the highest bit rate possible. Um, and then I bounce it. Uh, and then it turns, and then it comes all back in when it's all done. Um, then what happens is, is I, ha I, instead of having all of this going on in my timeline, then I just have one track with all that information I'll put together and, and it's nice and easy. Now, if you're at a point where you might want to go back and change some of those other things, like, oh, I, I'm going to probably move that text or I'm going to move that, that, sat, that audio isn't where I want it, then don't bounce it because you'll still be needing to do the edit, okay? Only bounce when you're at the point where you're like, all of the things I have on screen now, I am not going to change. I want to add some other stuff on top. This is permanent. None of this is going to change. I want to add some B-roll or I want to do a few more things. But you, if you notice your computer might be getting bogged down because you have so many things going on and, the, and it's like really tricky to render it and it's not running the way you want, um, you can bounce. My computer, thankfully, runs, it's a pretty strong computer, so I don't bounce as much as I used to. But when I had um, older computers that weren't as powerful and I started running 20, 30 tracks and you know, my timeline, you've all done this, right? Your timeline just looks like a horror show. It just has all kinds of stuff in it. I would bounce that out and go, let me do that. I'll bounce it, bring it back in and then I'll work on it some more. Just makes it a little bit easier for your, uh, takes it, makes it lighter load for your computer. So it's not trying to run like what we just did with the color correction. You saw how I, I was showing you how to color correct that footage. Now, every time I play that footage, Filmora has to read that piece of footage with the color correction I've added to it. So it has to interpret the color correction for every track I've color corrected. So there's a perfect example. Like if I color corrected something and I got it all put together and I'm asking it to do stuff and you think, well, it's just one track, but if you've already added all kinds of color correction and vignettes over it and you've changed the audio and done all kinds of EQing, you're asking it to do a lot of stuff. If you've added lots, you're asking that, that Filmora every time it reads it, it's applying the LUT, it's applying the color correction, so it's doing two things at once. It's not just playing your footage, it's adding the color corrections. So those kind of things take up space. So even if it's as simple as um, a lot of times, you know, like I'll, 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 you know, film my footage, but I'll use a different audio track. I'll record like whatever mic into Reaper or something. So it's recorded to a different software and I can really EQ it and compress it and get a better mic quality. So now I'll have my main footage coming in, that might have the reference audio from the camera, and then I'll, I'll sync up the audio from my mic, I'll color correct the footage, and I'll bounce that whole thing out so, it, so I now have a piece of footage that's color corrected, the audio is the right mic sound, <clears throat> and it's all in one track. It's not, you know, it's, it's all done. Now I just have one piece of footage. I do that a lot of times with like the hooks and stuff that I'm working on. Uh, Vampire Daniel, what was that one? That was from a while ago, oh, maybe. Is that me? Is that my look? Uh, let me quickly read here. Let's see. Is there a way? Uh, there is no keyframing in Filmora 9. Any other way around? No, I've covered this before when I had Filmora 9. You physically have to one by one, frame by frame, move whatever it is you're trying to move. Um, that was why they added frame, uh, keyframing in Filmora 10. If you have Filmora, a license for Filmora 9, and your computer can handle it, I would recommend upgrading to Filmora 10 because your same license applies. Filmora X is not a different software. It's Filmora 10. It's just an update to 9. Your active license from 9 applies to 10. So download it and use it, and you'll get the extra features. Um, and it's very similar to 9. I mean, it's just, it looks like it. As you can see, I was showing this. It's not like it's totally different. It still has all the basic stuff, right? It has, you know, your import window, your preview window, and your timeline. It just has a few more features hidden up in the upper left when you click on a, you know, you'll see, oh, well, there's some motion tracking and, oh, here's animation. I've got some custom key framing. They just added it on top. So it looks very similar. So you won't feel like it's a whole different thing. It won't confuse you. Um, hey, cool uncle. Hi, cool nephew. <laughs> Fire Brothers. Good to see you, pal. Uh, let me see. What's this question? Uh, hey, Dan, uh, um, how is your camera tracking video coming from Fillmore? It's not Fillmore 10. 
I didn't say I was doing that in Fillmore 10. I said I was doing a camera tracking one. I think I'm doing that one in Movavi. You want a sneak peek? If you want to see a sneak peek of the one I'm working on, I film things in hooks. I, have I told you guys this? So I'll film the beginning part to see if the thing that I want to teach is possible. And if I think I've got it, then I start working on the whole video, right? So um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make all these hooks and go, nah, I just, uh, it's not coming together right. And either I'll bail on it. I have more projects that I went, it's just, it's not looking the way I want it to look. The effect isn't as strong as I want it to be. Uh, it's not as fun as I want it to be. I also like them to have fun. Um, but if you want a sneak peek, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'll, I'll pop it up for you and you guys can, I'll, I'll let you watch it. <laughs> it's only like whatever, however many seconds long. Um, but it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. Um, a lot of times I, um, uh, I, I try to figure out um, the things that are most useful for creators out there. And it won't always be in Fillmore 10. It won't always be Movavi. Technique is a big thing for me. I'm a big fan of technique over tool. I, I try to teach you how to do things so that if it said, oh, if you have a software that has keyframing, try using try using you know this this technique and it doesn't matter if you use Movavi or whatever else you use or if you use Filmora if they all have keyframing features and, and I've taught you how to use the keyframing on my channel if, on each then you should go oh he's showing me in Filmora or Movavi but I have the other one and yeah I know how to use it yeah sneak peek hold on let me see let me see if I can find it I think I can play the video right from here um yeah I think so I think right here let me see if this is it there we go The camera tracking effect is a technique I get asked about a lot. If you want to learn how to pull this technique off in Movavi, stick around. I'll show you how. Don't stop now. I'm getting pretty good at this. Good Lord. <laughs> Your stupidity. It made me laugh and I want, that's kind of cool. So that's, um, yeah, that's a technique. A lot of people ask me about camera tracking, right? They go, I want to motion track me. And I go, that's not really motion tracking. There's no, neither, no, not Filmora 10, not Movavi. They don't have a button that you push and like, it'll just follow your face in one piece of footage. It can, it, you can tell it this thing in this piece of footage that's moving, I want you to attach text or another thing and I want you to follow it. So number two follows number one. But the question I got asked is how do I camera track my, how do I motion track my face? They really mean camera tracking, so. So yeah, that's a, I tried it, I did it with my hand. It's so ridiculous, right? I'll show you how to do it. It's a keyframing technique um, that you have to kind of think about ahead of time. Um, and it uses a couple features like beat detection. It uses, um, it uses keyframing and uh, yeah, it's just pure stupidity. I'll have that out in the next week. It's, um, it was a lot of fun to do. I'm, I'm sitting around here dancing like an idiot. My girlfriend is like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Uh, low spec, big effects, editing software, low spec, big effects, big effects means like directional blur, motion tracking, color grading, um, low spec, big effects. So you, uh, this is that question that always confuses me. Um, Arjun, you're asking me, I want something that does a whole lot, but I don't really have a good computer that can run it. So it has to be able to run on a crappy computer. You're just asking the wrong question. And I don't mean that as an insult. At some point, you're going to need to understand that every video editing software requires resources. And every time like Filmora or any one of these adds a new feature, it eats up more resources. It requires a stronger computer. So, you know, really what you're trying to do, directional blur, big effect, you know, you should get DaVinci Resolve. It's free. The, the free version is pretty good. It's not doesn't have all the features, but it has a ton of features. So go get DaVinci Resolve and then look at the, the specs that you would need for to run that and make sure that you've built your computer out so it significantly exceeds the minimum system requirements so that it'll run really smooth once you start adding a bunch of layers in. Um, I'm a big fan of DaVinci. If you use DaVinci, you're saving money on the cost of the software. Put that money into like a better graphics card and a better CPU, a little more RAM, that kind of stuff. Um, is Filmora 10 good? Yeah, I like it. Everything you've pretty much seen that anything, any video on my channel, any tutorial that was about a software, like if I was showing you how to do something in Filmora 10, I made that video, the entire video in Filmora 10. If I was showing you how to do something in Movavi Video Suite, I made that entire video, the whole thing. Um, in Movavi Video Suite, the same with Filmora Pro. If I do a video on Filmora Pro, I make the whole video in Filmora Pro. I just kind of feel that's the best way to, for me to stay up to par with how the software works and then to be really um, honest with you guys so I can say, no, yeah, I use it. Um, 
I, so, you know, is Fillmore on good or 10? Um, if I would, if you have a license for nine, upgrade to 10. <laughs> why is Fillmore not free? You know, why do you have a job? Why does your boss is probably thinking, how come he won't just work for free? Or she, call it John. John, they spend a lot of money. They have teams of people that they pay to design that software. They got to get paid. That's how they make money. You know, that's what, you know, that, how do you think anybody makes money? You know, why is Coca-Cola not free? Why is McDonald's not free? It's not free. You know, there are some out there that will, that, you know, some companies like DaVinci, if you want free, get DaVinci Resolve. It's it's right there. Um, you know, you could, and you can, um, and you can get it. But what Filmora does is they put it out with a trial version that has a watermark and you can test it out. And if you like it, then you can buy the license. And the license isn't very expensive. It's, you know, I think street price is about 60 bucks US, I think from .NET. They still have it about $59.99. Um, so yeah, just, just uh, you know, find the, you know, find the thing you like. I, for me, it's like, this is what life is. There are some free softwares out there that you can get and use, so use them. If you can't afford it, and I can understand that, there's some people just $60 US could be all the money in the world and say, I can't afford that. Well, then you're gonna have to find a way to make it work. It can't, you need to find a way to overcome these hurdles. Find some free software that you can use. People, plenty of people edit with things like iMovie. They edit with things like, um, you know, Windows Movie Maker. Um, that's how I started editing. So find something you can use. There's open source stuff out there that, that you can edit with um, that isn't bad. Um, so yeah, I think uh, let me see. One of the companies that approached me was InVideo, I N V I D E O, and they they're a web-based um, video editing software. Try them. I know they they're they're um they're free. They're free. They don't have any uh they don't have any uh, charge for what they use. They have a limitation on how many videos you can edit in a month, but it's a dumb amount. It's like sixty a month or something. Um, let me see. What should I get if I have a good PC? If you have a good PC, this is what I recommend. It, when it comes to video editing software, think about what you're making, all right? One size really doesn't fit all. It really doesn't. People say to me, yeah, Filmora you know, is 10 is, a, is an okay beginner software. I'm like, well, everything I, you know, you know, that, that I edit about Filmora, I edit on Filmora 10. So beginner, I don't, I mean, I've got almost 200,000 subscribers. I've, I make a six figure income editing videos. I do pretty well, so if that's a beginner, then uh, then I, call, I guess I'm a beginner. So you have to think about what it is you're trying to do. It does what I need it to do. Now, if I was trying to, um, you know, and I could do any kind of basic edits. If I was, you know, taking wedding videos, or if I was trying to start a business and I had to do birthdays and parties, and I was, you know, whatever, do commercials for people, I could do it all on Filmora 10. It has everything I need. Um, the real trick is learning how to film. Uh, the magic is not just in the editing, it's learning how to film. Uh, and that's where the, where the real professionalism comes across. So if I was going to do something and I wanted to work for a production house doing movies where I might have to do higher end, like horror effects and things, yeah, I don't know if Fillmore 10 would be the right software for that. I'd probably start working with like da, with DaVinci Resolve or Adobe Premiere Pro because they're, they're more tuned in, or maybe even After Effects would probably be better for that thing, horror movies, because it's got more of the stuff that would allow me to do those higher end things. Um, if I was going to start doing, if I ever wanted to work for like Disney and I wanted to do like, you know, animated stuff like that, I'd, I'd be using Blender. I'd spend more time with Blender. So find the right thing that you're trying to make, you know, figure out what it is you're trying to make and what you need it to do. Um, and then find the software that does that, you know, test them out. Most of them have a free trial or something, you know, like a watermark or something or a free week and just play around with it and go, does this feel right? Does this do what I need it to do? And if it does, yeah, go with that one. Um, yeah, Doug is absolutely right. If you want free, DaVinci da Resolve is killer. Now, the paid version of DaVinci Resolve is about, uh, I think it's a $299, Doug. I think it's $299 for the lifetime, or I don't know if it's the lifetime. I think it's for, I, I think it's all the upgrades come with it. I'm not sure if they still do that. It may be just until they go to the next version, 16, 17. I think it applies to all the upgrades afterwards. Once you buy it, you get all the upgrades. Um, but they have a free version that it's it, they limit some of the features, but the amount of features it has in the limited version is like twice the features that Filmora 10 has. But it's a not a, it's not all that drag and drop, right? You can't just click and go, oh, pop that in. So so if you if you don't need all that crazy stuff, then DaVinci might be more than you need. So yeah, two ninety nine lifetime. So it is. Uh, thank you, Jornel. It's a it's a it's a lifetime for that one. See, Filmora used to be that too. If you bought a lifetime individual license, you'd have it for the lifetime all upgrades came with it, but they changed it recently because of all the new features and said, 
um, and said, well, we're going to do it this way. You have all the updates for 10. And then if they go to 11, I guess, I guess we're no longer covered. We have to buy, I don't know what they'll do at that point. If it's a little bit more money to get the new update, if you already own the other one. Um, so it just depends. Just, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. And I don't know if, because when I bought the license, it told me at the time all future updates were included. So they might grandfather everybody who already has a Fillmore license that was purchased when that was the deal. Because I think it would be unfair to tell somebody back in the day, you're going to get all the future upgrades and then change that rule. So we'll see. They might say only the new licenses from here on out. If you bought it, you know, your, you know, in the last year then it no, it no longer does that. Uh, Filmora X always crashes with me because it's because of my computer. It's just Filmora uh, bugs. But yeah, it's usually it's your resources. Um, one thing I can tell you, um, F Flip Bro, what you want to think about here, let me pull this up for you. Um, when you're running Filmora, uh, let me give you a little tip here. One of the things you can do is if you're running a project like this, uh, let me pull my, uh, Hold on one second. Let me get the. Uh, I gotta get. I got all this stuff being shared. I don't want that. Hold on a second. You get out of there. You go over there. That's what I'm. That's what I need to be showing. If you're running Filmora, um, one thing you want to do is let me make sure I can get this. Uh, you can run your um, your task manager, and if you're using PC, I'm a PC guy by the way. So if you run your task manager, right, it'll open up um, this um, window. Hold on a second. More details, more details. I want the full thing. The more details. Get the full one here, um, and it'll show you everything that's running. So right here, you see up top, it says CPU right now because I'm live streaming and I have software open. It's running about 7% of my CPU. In terms of my memory, um, that's like my RAM, how much RAM it's pulling right now. It's running about 13%. In terms of my disk space memory, not very much at all. My GPU, because I have a pretty good GPU, it's running only about 4%. Uh, and then it tells me what each thing runs. Like, uh, you know, these are power consumptions, physically power from my, from my um, computer itself. I run, I run an 850 gold power supply, so just to make sure that I'm got, putting up plenty of power for the things I'm doing. But you can run this, right? And a lot of times what I'll do, let me put this full screen, is I'll run and edit. Let me mute this so that you're not, you don't have to hear me talking all over the place. Let me pull up the mixer, kill the sound, okay. And if you're running a project like this, right, and it's just running, one of the things you can do is open up this and then take a look. See how my CPU usage went up? to you know, 28, 26%, 11%, I can start seeing what is getting drawn down in my system resources. So if you are noticing problems and then things are crashing, open up your task manager and if you, want, if you see something get pretty high pinned, if it starts becoming 75, 80, 90% usage, that'll tell you that you, you need to upgrade your processor, you need to upgrade your graphics card, you need to upgrade your memory, you know, put some more RAM in there. Um, this is a really great way to just monitor um, the kind of drawdown in resources that Fillmore is putting as a strain on your computer. Uh, it's a real simple way to solve that issue and I don't think a lot of people know that. I, again, sometimes I think people just, they, they install software and they go, it crashed, there's something wrong with you know either my computer or Filmora. And what it is that you're just using up, you're asking your computer to do too much. You know, maybe you've had too many tracks going on and you have an older computer with a lower, you know, lower graphics card or an older processor. So just use that, it's a really uh, quick, easy way to, um, to upgrade uh, you know, things and know, and know what you need to upgrade. Uh, what's this one right here? Uh, architectural sheet metal, $5 super chat. Thank you, my friend, I appreciate that. Do you have a video on workflow of an entire project? How long did it take to find, wow, how long did it take to find the sweet spot for the producing a final product? I don't have one on a tire workflow. I, I've done ones on like uh, how to get your files set up. Um, where I talked about how I set up every project has like a, I create a um, separate file that's the name of the video project. And in, in that video project, I create subfolders that are, you know, there'll be like an audio folder, a video folder, an images folder, and I start breaking up all the pieces and I put those usually on an external drive so that it's all there. You know, if I ever come back to that project and I go like, oh, there was some images I used in that, they're right there in the image folder. Where's the video clips? What audio, what music did I, if I come back and I go, oh, there was a video I used a great song that I found somewhere. What was that song? I can go back and usually find it. Um, and I talked about my workflow a bit. Like I you just saw, I played the intro hook, right, of that new thing I'm working on, the camera tracking. I'll build that first and I'll go, can I do the thing? 
can I, uh, I literally have to learn the trick. So I'm editing and learning how to do it. Go, yes, I can do it. No, I can't. Yes, it looks good. No, it doesn't. And once I think I figured out the thing, then I reverse engineer and I will actually um, walk through how I did it, right? And I'll start, I'll start build, doing it live where I'm, you know, I'm sitting there talking into a mic and I'm actually doing it right while I'm screen capturing Filmora. Uh, and then I bring that into my project and then I'll use things like the crop and zoom tool so I can zoom into certain parts. So if I go, you know, you know, in the upper left, and I'll have the, you know, I'll have it zoom into the upper left, things like that, just to make it all come together. So really, that's where my workflow is really thinking about um, story arc. You know, I, my, my, my videos are different than other people's tutorials, because everybody was always kind of putting out these boring tutorials that taught that, uh, for me, they were for me they were boring. I'm not insulting anybody else, but they were like, I always seemed like they talked too long to get to the point. And I wanted to make a channel where I showed how people how to make better content just quickly. You want to learn how to do this? Let me show you. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Here it is. And I would try to do it in a way that was funny or clever. Um, instead of just like simple, I try to make it fun if, whenever I could. And if it's fun, I go, there we go. It's fun. And then I would, um, and then, and then I, and I, I go backwards in the storyline and go, now let me show you how to do it. And I start right from the beginning to the end and get you back to the thing I showed you at the beginning. It seems to work. Uh, seem, people seem to dig that, that workflow. Uh, Funko Illuminati. I got the Illuminati in the house. Uh, thank you for the $5 super chat. I really appreciate that, my friend. Love the channel. Uh, love your channel ideas. Really help improve my video editing and my content. Man, I'm so happy to hear that. Um, I really do. The goal of this channel has always been twofold. Um, is to help people make better content, better video content. So when, the, you know, this is for anyone who's out there making videos. Specifically, I tend to work with um, YouTube. When I think videos, uh, you know, my whole goal is to that when you make videos, most of the people out there are putting them onto YouTube and then they're trying to grow a YouTube channel. So those two things are, are really connected, like learning how to make the, the product, the video, to make that look good, and then going over and getting it on, getting it onto YouTube and then learning how to get your YouTube channel growing so that you got the video, but then you got to kind of like put it in the stores, right? And get people to buy it. <laughs> so those two things, the way they work together is really um, the goal of my channel. It's, it was, it's a lot of people ask me that question, like, why aren't you doing more Filmora? And I've done like a, a hundred and something Filmora tutorials. Like I've talked it to death. I do live streams to answer some of the leftover questions. Um, but I literally try to do all of the things I can possibly do. Uh, and I kind of ran out of space. I'm like, there's, there's almost nothing I haven't covered. So so the, the idea is to really teach people technique and then apply those techniques to videos and then get those videos onto YouTube and then show you how to, um, once you got them onto YouTube, what's the next step? So that's always been my goal. And I love when anyone tells me, you helped me with my video editing, you've helped me grow my channel. All of that stuff is, that means the world to me. That's why I do this. The reason I do this is to help everyone out there meet their their goals and if you're just trying to create a video editing business you know a lot of people out there that they you know they they film weddings and they do parties and they want to make a little money on the side or they want to grow channels they want to take their video content put it on youtube i try to cover that and every time i see someone doing well we get stories like i'm just about to get monetized i love it i love it it makes me it really makes me uh the happiest guy in the world because i feel like i did something right um, I like your energy. How old are you? I'm 54. <laughs> I sometimes uh, I feel 73, but I'm 54. Yeah, uh, I, I do have some energy, some, sometimes too much energy for my age. I'm getting older by the minute. Um, you ever tried vlogging in the near future? Uh, you know, vlogging is a, um, is a style of filming, right? And I did do one kind of vlog where I actually went out. I had gotten um, one of my videos got taken down and I got a channel strike. And they, uh, they accused me of teaching people how to steal Filmora, which was funny because at the time I was sponsored by Filmora. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I, it was such a weird moment in my life. I'm like, oh, holy crap, I've got a lot of Filmora um, videos. Am I going to start getting three, four, five new channel strikes and lose my channel? If they think this video is teaching people how to steal Filmora, and it wasn't, it was showing them how to do a technique. I had nothing to do with stealing or anything. Um, I was wondering what was going to happen. So I literally was, it, it hit me so hard. I literally grabbed my camera and I live on the New England sea coast. I'm a, you know, about a mile back from the beach. It was like in the winter, I went out to the beach, grabbed my camera and I just walked and, and talked about it and built a video. That was the closest thing I've ever done to vlogging where I walked out, you know, and, and walked around the, the, the ocean side, you know, uh, along the coast with people looking at me, which is something I'm not used to. I'm not used to filming out in public. I'm usually in the studio. So it was a neat experience. Um, uh, 
but I got to tell you, it was uh, it was it was tricky. I, it's a weird thing. Like you're talking into a camera, and people walk by and they're looking at you. Because around here, they're not used to seeing a lot of you know content creators walking around talking to a, a, themselves, basically, right? Talking to a camera that they're holding out. So I've tried it. It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, but you know, the thing about vlogging is, if you're a vlogger, vlogging itself isn't a th- um, a co- isn't content. It's a style. So you have to know what you're vlogging about. It still had when I did my. It was kind of a vlog. Um, it, you know, it, it was a vlog style where it was filmed sort of day in the life. Uh, it was still true to the thing: how to grow your YouTube channel. And I had run into a thing where growing my channel, I got hit with a channel strike. And I said, I should probably talk to creators about this because it's very disheartening. I've seen a lot of people get a channel strike or a community guideline strike or get a, a you know a, a claim on some music they used. And, it, and it, it's really disheartening. It can crush you if a video that, like I, that video they took down had you know, 100,000 views or something. I don't know. And it made money and they just took it down. They just took it right. It was gone. It didn't exist. It was just gone. So I was like, you know, that was something I wanted to talk about. So yeah, that's the closest ever thing I ever did to uh, I ever did the vlogging. Maybe we'll try it again sometime. Great content, Daniel. I've learned a lot. Hi from Cape Cod, Cape Cod, Mass. Not too far south of me. Uh, I'm up on the New England Sea Coast. I'm up near the New Hampshire, Massachusetts line. So yeah, Cape Cod. I spent a lot of time in Cape Cod uh, over the years. Uh, let me see. Question here. Uh, so I questioned uh, how you color shift. Did you find anything? No, color shift, again, color shift is a very specific technique where you literally can move all the colors from within. Um, and I told you, it's something that uh, the, the real answer is here. You can't do it with Filmora. The longer answer is if I find an interesting way to do it, I'll let you know. I think this is the exact same answer I gave you before. I don't, I'm not trying to blow you off. These things that things that you can't easily do, um, or that, uh, that I can't show someone a quick hack around that they hadn't thought of. I don't waste time on like, okay, well you need to get three other pieces of software to make this happen. Those really aren't the kind of things I try to teach. Uh, even when I stepped, that's one of the reasons I stopped doing so many Fil- Filmora tutorials is I, I had done so many things that it got to the point where it's like, all right, well, if you bring in Affinity Photo and you use that in conjunction, I was starting to have to use multiple different pieces of software to show somebody something new in Filmora. And I went, well, now I know I've reached the saturation point. Like I've, I've covered all the other things. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, it's a technique. Uh, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you're asking the wrong thing. Get the right tool for the job. If you want to learn a color shift technique, try DaVinci Resolve or Adobe. It'll do it so much easier. And there's a ton of great videos showing you exactly how to do that on YouTube. But if I stumble across an easy way to do it, I'll, it's, it is on my list. Okay. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll see, uh, I'll see what happens. Can you animate in Filmora? I did. Um, you, I did. It was hard. But it's not an animation software. We get this question a lot. If you want to do animation, like actual animation, get a different software. I like Toon Boom Harmony. T-O-O-N, Toon, like cartoon, boom, like the word boom, harmony. Um, they, the, the, the creators of Family Guy use it to make Family Guy episodes. Very, really, really, really good um, um, yeah, software for doing that kind of thing. That video was great. Very personal. Yeah, it was a different one for me, Tish. I it was it caught me off guard, but <laughs> you know, I was trying to. I, I knew other people probably went through that, and I figured if I talked about it, it might help any other creators who felt they had been, you know, kneecapped. Yo, Daniel, uh, keep uh, keep on keeping on. Your vids are the best uh, on video tips and tricks. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. Um, uh, thanks to you, my channel is picking up speed and growing. That's oh, awesome. You uh, hit over 16,000 views in three weeks. That's really good. That's, that's some nice speed, huh? So uh, for my channel, that's a boatload. Hey, for anybody's channel, 16,000 people have watched your video. Or have you gotten 16,000 views? You know, some of those are probably twice, hopefully. Um, that's fantastic. Um, that's, I love seeing that. Uh, hey, Paulus, good to see you. Uh, Paulus picks. I'm um, late, but yeah, happy Friday. Yeah, it's not just Friday, it's Friday. Uh, how do you remove background and replace it? Long story short, cool gamer is you can't, but you can hack some of those. Um, I did a remove the sky video, uh, where I actually took a piece of footage where people were laying on the beach and there was just the sky and I removed the sky and changed it to a whole different thing. So, but it was all about, you can't do it in Filmora. I had to use another piece of software externally, create a mask, pull it out. Um, if you want to do that, if you're looking at trying to rotoscope, is learn this word, rotoscope. Um, Filmora X, uh, 10 does not rotoscope. You want to try uh, DaVinci Resolve or Adobe Premiere Pro will do that really nicely and easily. How to remove background. You can't, yeah, see, keep asking. I'll keep giving you the same answer. <laughs> you can't in Filmora 10. I'm using your Indiana Jones uh, flight path video. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. I did a follow-up on that. There's a short on my channel where I, I did the line, 
But there's a short, if you go to my channel and look at for the shorts, I think you, you should be able to, yeah, you should be able to find it. It's, it's with, I did it with the plane. After Filmora added the keyframing, I took that exact same footage and I took an image of a plane and I stuck it on top of the line. And with keyframing, I was able to put that plane. So now instead of just a line going, there was a little plane on the screen and I overlaid it. That was a perfect example of a bounce. I took the original footage, it had all the original stuff on it, and I just added the plane. It was already done. I just added the plane over the line and it was perfect. I'm like, there you go. Uh, that, that was one of those ones where I, it wasn't worthy of a whole video, so I just did it as a short. It's under 60 seconds, and I quickly showed how you can add the plane. But I'm glad that one's been helpful. A lot of people like that one. It was something different. I'd never seen anyone do uh, do that kind of a how do you do a map animation kind of line like Indiana Jones. And uh, it came to me one day. I was like, yeah, I should do that, you know. Um, I have a road route. on Glimpse. Any advice for making the road route do the same thing as the flight path? Um the only trick you have to be aware of, if you're doing that Indiana Jones technique I did, I did it with very kind of straight lines. What can happen is, is if you're doing a road, they do, the, do it the exact same way, Toby, right? So if a road one is going to be more curvy, take one image without the, road, without the road traced, right? And then do another one with the road traced. You can trace the curvy line or you can... You know, if you can get the same shot that turns on the root and turns off the root. But if you have it, I've done this before too, where I did, I just trace the curvy line to the root. Um, and then you're going to do that same transition. But sometimes the line, because the way I did that, I was using the, the uh, erase slide, which went one direction. <clears throat> if your line goes up or down, you'll have to rotate your footage, right? So that it's rotated in a way that the left or right swipe still works for it. I actually have details on that in the description of that Indiana Jones map transition, trans, uh, map animation, how to move in different directions. And it's all about just, instead of trying to get a different effect, to, you just gotta turn, your, turn your, your footage a different direction and then it works. Um, let me see. Hey, I wanna start my career as a as freelance as video editor, fantastic. Is Filmora 10 enough or should I go for Premiere Pro? I'll tell you, if you haven't done it before, if you're gonna do a freelance video editor, you're probably gonna want something high, a higher grade. Um, Adobe Premiere Pro is expensive um, and it integrates with all the other stuff. It's $249 a year in recurring fees. You can't buy Adobe Premiere Pro. You, subs you have a subscription, it's subscription based. It's very good, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's better than DaVinci Resolve. So if you were going to do something, I would tell you, freelance video editor trying to do something good, I would tell you da DaVinci Resolve the paid version for $299, you buy it once, you have it. That's where I'd probably go because that's gonna give you a ton of functionality because if you're a freelancer, you never know what someone else is gonna ask you to do for a job. And Fillmore at 10 might not be enough if somebody wants you, if you get hired to do a commercial and you have to have some big special effects like, I want to fly away like Superman. It's not that you couldn't do it in Fillmore at 10, but you'd have to work really hard to, uh, because some of the features you would need for like, you know, tracing and things like that and blending modes that don't really exist on Fillmore at 10. So if it's going to go freelancing, you're really going to start a career. I'd say make the investment. Um, the great thing about DaVinci is uh, the free version is free. You can start using it today. Um, and you can decide, like, I've used, been using it for a couple months. I love it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for the pro version. So you could start with that one right off the bat. It wouldn't cost you a thing. And you can absolutely make professional content with the free version of DaVinci Resolve. Um, let's see. Glad you have a cool uncle like you. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. In India, uncle's called Kaka. Yeah, we call something else Kaka here in, <laughs> here in the United States. So I'll know next time I hear that. If someone calls me Kaka, I won't, I won't get insulted. <laughs> I'll try not to be. Uh, Abdullah Khan, please make a video on setup. Oh, you know what? I that's a, Thank you for reminding me. Um, I'm planning on doing one. People have been asking me to do a studio tour for forever because I've changed everything and I've got monitors, cameras, gear, and I and I, I was trying to get it all done. It's still There's still some stuff that's not done. I've got new motorized sliders coming in that the camera mounts to, so it'll be able to like actually have the camera, I can hit a button and it'll actually track behind me and move and uh, and I can use that for doing product shots. And so I get a bunch of stuff coming, so I'm not done, but it's on my list, I promise. I'll do it before the studio's done. It's close enough done that I can walk you through how I do it, um, and I absolutely will. Okay, I, it's on my list, I, I, uh, I will. Uh, hi, enjoy your channel. What software can you use for sports, uh, i.e. baseball scoreboard? Yeah, you can use Fillmore 10 for that, totally. Um, let's see if we can pull something up and make that happen. For scoreboards, I did this with a with a timer. Have you guys ever seen I did a, a timer video 
where all I did was um, uh, I I screen captured a timer and I put it over. If you wanted to do a sports, here let me let's see if we can do this quickly. Let me go. Um, let me go really quickly. Let me see if I can uh, find a piece of sports footage. Uh, let me one second. Because I can just show you quickly how to do this. This isn't the kind of thing I... This could be a tutorial, I suppose. I don't know if we really need a tutorial for this one. We'll do it right on the fly, right? Let me do this. I'm going to find a piece of footage. I'm going to go to Storyblocks. That's where I get all my footage from. I love Storyblocks. The, well worth the price of admission, if you ask me. Um, I'll do this right live. I can actually show you. Okay, so let's go to story blocks. This is the audio. Let me go to video. Let's go to video footage and let's see if we can find. I don't know. What do you want to do? Baseball? Um, let's do baseball. Let's see if we can find some baseball footage. Uh, all right. So maybe there's, you know, there's 13 seconds, 15 seconds, 19 seconds. This one's like, yeah, there's something going on in here, right? Let's just grab this one. So here's a piece of footage. I'll grab that one. Pitcher doing his thing. Um, so I'll steal that. Let me not steal it. I'm paying for it. Don't worry. I think I might logged in. Oh, man. Am I not signed in? I may not be signed in. Oh, I have to restart. Oh, my plan disk became due again. Oh, dang it. All right. Uh, let me do it with something else. I'll just show you with anything. I must, my, my plan must have just run out. So they're like telling me I got I to gotta, uh, I gotta pay for this year now. Uh, but I'm not putting my credit card information in front of you. I love you all, but you're not seeing that. <laughs> okay. So let's just do it this way. Let's just say this footage in my timeline is is some is sports, okay? Uh, work with me. We'll do this. We'll do this fast and dirty, okay? So what you would do is say this is a piece of sports footage here. Um, what I would tell you is um, in the upper left, uh, in the media tab, see right over here in the upper left, let me make this bigger so that you can see it. Um, there is this project media folder shared files, but see where it says um, like um, sample colors. You can do this. You can grab a sample color and you can bring it down on top of your footage. It's just a color, it's just a block of color, right? It's blocking the whole screen now. Let me click on that to highlight it. See how it's all checkered dots right now. And now I can put that up in the corner, right? And I go, okay, let me do this. Let me put a black box up there. And then let's do another thing. Well, maybe we want to put a border on that, right? We want to kind of make it look like a sign. Is that the right color? What color is a sports sign? Is it black? Yeah, they're kind of blackish. But use whatever color works, right? So now let me go to effects. Uh, and I'm going to go into the search bar. I use this search bar up top all the time just to find things quickly. Border. And I'm going to bring a border down onto my black color. Uh, let me click on that. Let me go to video effects in the upper left. Here's my border. Let me increase the size. And why is it not showing me the border though? Uh, it should. Uh, 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 direction. Start and it should be all. Yeah, for some reason it's not showing me on this one. It usually lets me do that. Um, all right, let's do it old school. Uh, let's put that one there. I'm going to go back up to the media file. I'll get another sample color. Uh, I'll do white and I'll put that down below it. I'll do, I'll make my own border. This is, this is literally how I do everything. People ask me, how do you come up with these ideas? I'm like, I don't know. I just build stuff until it looks right. So let me go a little bit bigger. Let's put a white border around that, right? Uh, something like this. And I'll move that. I'll nudge that right there. Let me get the white one to shrink in just a touch. All right, so now it kind of looks like a box with a border, right? So now it's a box. Now, now that you have that, you go, okay, what else would a scoreboard look like? Um, and you go, okay, let me go out to a title track. A lot of people ask me this, guys. If you're ever trying to find um, text that has no motion whatsoever, go up to the titles in the upper left. Click on included. Make sure you've got included, all 276. And then type in the word default, D-E-F. It'll pop right up. This is a title that has no motion, nothing. It's just text, okay? And if you put that into your track, it's just text. So now you could go, okay, well, there's my text. And when I click on that, it opens up in the upper left my ability to change the text. So let me say the score is uh, zero, zero. Or maybe I want to say like home. Oh, wow. We had two teams, right? Home and visitor. So I go visitor. I'm going to make that. I can't spell visitor to save my life. All right. Now I'm going to shrink that. And I'm going to put that right up here. I'm going to say, here's my scoreboard. And I'm doing this fast and dirty. You can you could get like a cool overlay that you can find online or you could use your photo editing software to make a better scoreboard looking box. Home visitor. And let's get one more um, default title track to put on top of that one. And 
Now you can say, I need this to be the actual score. So I'm gonna say zero, what is it, double zeros, right? Zero, 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 or maybe it's just single zero. I don't know what I'm doing. Let's do single zero, space, and one. Um, and I might have to change the space in between the two to have that work a little better. Um, so let me shrink it down a little. Let me see, home, visitor, let me make sure it's kind of centered. Let me stretch it out a little bit. Yeah, let me put a little space in between so it's more centered under that one. Whoops. Um, that's See how I just accidentally moved the track? That's why a lot of times down on the lower left, I'll lock the tracks that I already have in place so I don't accidentally click and move something. That's what that lock is really for. A lot of times people ask me, like, what's the lock for? It's so idiots like me don't accidentally nudge something and, like, oops, screwed it up. All right. Does that kind of look uh, like it's in place, kind of centered? So there's this visitor, right? Okay, so here, maybe you're go. No, let's stretch this. Let me unlock it so I can stretch this out. Now you can stretch these the entire length of, I'm clicking on all of them and stretching them. Um, you know, the entire length of the footage you need the scoreboard for. Now let's say you're playing along and we're counting the amount of times that the home team scores. The score changes right here. Boom, stop. Now this is the... The top track is the numbers, right where you want the score to change. Just highlight the number track, and I want you to split it, okay? And now in this remaining piece, go up and go, okay, I want to change the zero to a one, because let's say the home team just scored. And what would happen is, as this is playing through, this first section um, right here, you can see it's zero to one, and when it hits that split, boom, it changes one to one. So that's a simple way to do it. And you can keep changing the score as you go. You know, here's where I needed to go. You know, I need to go two to one. Really, really simple way. Think about layerings. There's always some easy way to solve the problem. Now, I took two boxes and made that, but you could go onto something like pixabay.com and look up like a cool scoreboard. They may have a free, a free image, a PNG with a transparent background that you could put up there. Uh, and you go, oh, that looks that looks just like a scoreboard. But simple techniques like that is just understanding layering. I need a box. I need another outline of that box. So I'll put a box around a box. I need to say home visitor and I need numbers under it. I need to be able to change the numbers, split that track wherever you need it to change and change the values in there. Uh, and that's just a real simple way to do it. Um, and then you have all the control in the world, right? Because then you, you could have this game go on. Nobody scores until this point, right? So you would split that top track again. And you go up, okay, the, the, I'm going to go up in the upper left, and I'll say the visitor team just scored. I'll change that to two. And then we have the exact same thing happen right here. Is It's one-to-one -one until that point, and then it's like, oh, blam, the visitor just scored another run. And that's a score, simple scoreboard. So think about, you know, sometimes I think up, a lot of these things that we do are, are just thinking about it. Think what you want it to do, and don't think in terms of one thing, like one button. Think like, how can I create that? Do I, have, do I, have, do I know how to put numbers on screen? Yes. Okay, let me do that. Do I know how to change numbers? Yeah, I bet you if I just split the footage, I, I can then change what it is. Cool, so simple things like that are a great way to... Um, to create layers. Uh, Foot, Foot Dr. Zach, have a great weekend. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. And um, I got to talk to you about your live stream. I, I, you had almost 200 people in there. You like, crushed it the other day. So congrats on the, on the uh, live stream. Congrats on the growth of your channel, man. You're killing it. Um, we'll talk in group. <laughs> I want to hear more about what happened. Uh, thanks again for the super chat, pal. Much appreciated. Um, let's see. Who, uh, who is this me? Uh, what is my dream job? This is my, if this, if you're asking me, I don't know if you're answering someone else in the chat. Um, this is my dream job. I was a professional musician, which I loved doing, but I never made the kind of money I, I wanted to make. It was just, even with being on major labels and touring, the, it, you have to really have huge, huge international hits to make some money because everybody eats the money up before you get it. Um, and I love playing, but it wasn't, the, I thought that was going to be my dream job. And then I had a you know career as a general contractor, remodeling homes and businesses for years. So I would do both. I'd tour, I'd come back, and then I'd build. And then I later on, when I got a little older, you know, it's music is a young man's game. So I, I would just strictly was just doing general contracting. And when I started getting into content creating, it, it was all of the it was all of the joy of making music, right? It was the same, like, oh, I love creating layers and music and creating that, you know, all the different parts. So it gave me all of that joy. I got to talk to people, like being out at a, you know, I got to travel. I've got, I've been able to go to VidCon, VidSummit. I get to go to a lot of things where I get to, you know, get up and talk to people. 
Um, so that's wonderful. Um, and then I get, and I, and I actually make a living at this. Like I make, I have brands that come and want to work with me. So this really has become my dream job, just being a content creator and leveraging that. Um, it took me 54 years to, to end up in my dream job, <laughs> but uh, this is it, man. I, I love it. I love what I do. I'm, a, I'm, I, I, every day I tell my girlfriend, I say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed that it took a lot of work, but I'm blessed that I was able to get here. Um, you know. It's just a great place to be. Hey, Heidi, thank you so much for the super chat. You didn't need to do that, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do, Dan. You're an awesome part of the YouTube community. I really appreciate it. I do. I, I have my moments where I'm a cranky old bastard, but I, I try to be a positive influence <laughs> when I can. When I can, I try to be a positive influence. Uh, music is a young man's game. Tell that to Keith Richards. I know, yeah, but he started when he was young. It's easier when you've really, you know, like a lot of the people that I know that I play with over the years have stayed with it. And it's tricky like some of my favorite, some of the bands I played in, like I played with, you know, like the, 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 the lead singer of Godsmack, you know, like I produced their demos. I played with them. The, he was my drummer. I played with Sully for years and he kept going and pushed it and was able to be successful. And God bless him. He does great. Some of the other bands I played with, like two of the guys I played with in Cry of Love, they're now Cheryl Crow's band. So they're the guitar player and bass player for Cheryl Crow. And they love it. They stick with it. But it's so funny when I talk to them. They're like, yeah, it's so weird. Like, they're not playing right now. They're not touring. So they're sitting at home like, uh, when is this pandemic going to be over? I'm blessed because this job here I'm in, the pandemic didn't really inhibit my ability to make content. And in fact, more people ended up on the internet looking for, well, I'm stuck at home. I might as well do some video editing. And a lot of my videos started getting more views. So it was really good. I, I got to really, you know, I was stuck at home more. I'm a homebody anyway. So it all worked out. This job has been just really been great. I'm just a huge, um, I, I'm a huge fan of all content creators. So for me to be able to do it and um, be part of that sort of conversation as little as I am, uh, just really is fantastic. Uh, any tips for a cinematic trailer? I'm working on that. I just did two videos recently on my channel that were both based around how to do c cinematic things. One, how to get kind of a look, how to think about creating color, um, and, and filming and thinking about how to, you know, you know, how you would film it and how to get a look, um, for the setting up your shot. And the other one I did was sound layering. Um, sound is everything. I think you, people forget how much soundscape, which is sound design, what you build around the, the, the video itself, really can make things feel so much more cinematic that people just think cinematic, and I think they think the look of it, how it looks, and they don't realize it's the sound. If you if you turn off the sound to a very cinematic movie, it's like you lose half the experience. So check out those two videos. They're very recent. They're within the last you know three or four weeks. Is to watch those. They'll get you there. Um, uh, should I do stand up? I should never do stand up. I'm not that funny. <laughs> do you do a course of video editing, or was uh, or did you do a course of editing, or was it self ex and experience taught? Yeah, I was self taught. I didn't take any. I didn't take any courses. I just started playing with it, and each thing I learned, I went, oh, that's a cool trick. And every time I wanted to do something and I couldn't get it to do, I'd figure out a way to get it to do it. And that's then that I had another channel first, and then when I started this channel, I said, you know what, I should. I should take that thing that I'm doing, which is learning how to be a better video, video editor and trying to grow my YouTube channel and make a YouTube channel about trying to make better video edits and growing a YouTube channel. And that's how I got here. Um, that's been the whole thing. Uh, very, um, very, uh, hey, uh, Tish. Oh, Tish, you dropped that link in there. Yeah, I appreciate it if that's one of them. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's been a process of just kind of teaching myself. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm funny, funny looking. Uh, there's a thing I always feel like this has always been my attitude. When I see anyone do anything, I go, if that person can do it, I can do it. Because if a if a human being can do it, I can do it. And I don't mean that there's limitations. If I watch Tony Hawk do a you know a vert ramp, I go, I can't do that. <laughs> but when it comes to things like video editing, or if I'm watching someone. Um, you know, if, if that's how I got into, you know, playing guitar, if someone else can play guitar, if I've seen so many people play guitar, if they can do it, I can do it, right? I, I must, I can figure it out. So I always try to do, do to bring that to video editing. Like when I see something, I'm like, if that can be done, then I can figure out a way to do it. Uh, and, and I'm not going to rely on the video editing software to do it for me. I'm going to think about how that's created, just like that scoreboard thing I, we were just talking about. You know, how, what am I looking at? A box with names and letters. All right, can I make boxes? Can I make names? Can I make, no, I mean, letters and numbers? Yeah, okay, Phil Moore does that. Cool, let me just figure out how to put them together. And, uh, and then I just try to I think about how to do that, you know. 
um, you know, just figuring out the best ways to layer things um, so that it makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's see, Daniel, it's, uh, Daniel's such, it's, oh yeah, it's so much more than a lot. You know, a lot of people think it's just, I'll oh, put a one, you know, hit a button and then things look cinematic and it's not, it's everything from the way you, you, you set up your lighting and set up your camera. Let me ask a quick, quick question in the chat. How many of you guys out there right now in this chat, how many are you fil- how many of you are filming on cameras and how many of you are using like a mobile device, like a phone or something to, f- to film with, or uh, you know, whatever. What device is your main device for filming? Because there's also action cameras and stuff. Quickly, just write camera, or phone. Or, I'd like to know what you guys are using um, in the chat for actually filming. Because I, sometimes I think I talk a lot about um, one type of filming, and I want to make sure that I'm covering all bases. With um, I don't talk about a lot of um, mobile filming, and I should. I should talk about it more. I've done some, but not a lot. So I'm seeing, let's see. Uh, a lot of good answers here too. Okay, so we got we got victims of memes using his phone. We got uh, Peter's using his webcam. There's a phone. There's a phone. Phone GoPro. That's a great one. Phone and Vivo. Phone uh, Canon M50 mirrorless. I have one of those. That's a really good one. Didn't connect. That's a great. Ca- that's a great camera. Um, Vivo phone. Vivo phone special for camp. Nice camera. So, you know, J- uh, Justin uses a camera. I know he's got some nice gear. Uh, but a lot of you guys, three different cameras. Look at you, not playing around. Oh, let me find it. There it is. A coffee talk attack. Three different. Cam- I have three of the same cameras. <laughs> I have this camera that I'm using right here. I bought. I loved it so much. I it, and the lens that's on it. It's a Sony A6400 with a, a Sigma 16 millimeter f 1.4 lens that I bought another one and put it on top of it and turned it sideways so that I can film um, 16 by nine and nine by 16 at the same time. And then I put another one up to the side, which I'm not running today, which gives me another angle in my studio. All three of the, so I have three cameras that uh, uh, right around me right now, but they're all identical. <laughs> You'd think I would break it up a little bit. I do have an M52 that's in the closet, but I don't use that one as much anymore. Um, cause they're, they don't, they don't, they're not as easy to live stream and stuff with. So that's why I've been leaning towards the Sony's, um, Samsung note, uh, 20 and a GoPro. You just screen record. Hey, that hey, if that works, Astro Jade, then that's all you need to do. Um, this is cool. You know what I'll do, guys? I do have action cameras, and um, I do have mobile devices. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll try to do a few more pieces of content, really just grabbing a camera and talking about how we can really maximize the look of our video before we get it into the editing software using a phone. Um, I have an older, uh, I have an iPhone. It's only an iPhone 10. You know, so it's nothing super special. It's a couple of years old. Uh, I think I still have a Samsung Galaxy kicking around, so I'll make sure I do it. Uh, let me ask one more question. I know I'm asking all the questions, you guys. Are you guys, of the people who are using mobile devices, are you Android or are, um, Apple? A- I Android or, or Apple? Which one? Just scream it out. If you're Apple, Android, uh, I want to get a better idea for which one more of you guys are using. I know Android tends to be um, overall a, a more purchased um, mobile device than the Apple is because the Apple was always more expensive, but now the Androids are all pretty expensive too. Um, but they, they sell more Androids than they do Apples. Android for life, Android, uh, Rochella says Android, Toby, Android, Yash says Android. All right. All right. I'm here. What, you know, we got, uh, uh, Paula, uh, as Apple. All right. So a little back and forth, a little back and forth, but I'm seeing more Android. Okay, I'll make sure that I get, I'll use a little bit of each so I don't, because one of the things I hate is when someone shows you how to do something with like a an, an iPhone and you go, oh, I, just, I don't have an iPhone. I don't even have that app, you know? So I'll try to make sure that I'm use that I, I kind of mix up a little bit of both and maybe I can show you how to use two at once. Um, I've got a, I've got a crappy old Samsung Galaxy S6 that's broken. It barely stays charged. So I'll see if I can film something cool with that because if I can make something look good with that, then any one of you guys out there should uh, should be able to do it. So I'll do that. I'll, I'll make sure I bring some more of that stuff. And that would be a great topic. Really figuring out how to get your mobile device to look um, more professional would be probably something really fun. There's some really great camera apps out there that you can get for cheap money, 5 to $15, that give you manual control of your focus and things like that so you can get that bokeh blur. I've talked about the bokeh blur before on the last stream. Like if you look behind me, the thing that this camera lens does is all of the stuff behind me gets a little blur because of the focal length. Um, but there's some camera apps that you can do that too. The new iPhones do it too. You can just pretty much point them at something and they, the foreground stays clear and it bokeh blurs the background. But um, I would, uh, but I'll, I'll definitely work on those. Daniel Patel, would love to see your device to computer media transfer prof. Uh, for me, for my device, um, what I do is be, um, 
it depends what I'm doing. 90% of the time on what I do, Toby, is my cameras are all SD cards. So all I do is I pop the SD card out of the camera and I just pop it into the USB port of whatever, whichever one of my computers I'm editing on. Um, and then that's it. It just boom, brings it right in and then I just pop it into a folder. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the only time there's any issues in there is if I'm shooting raw. You know, raw doesn't have all the compression on it. So it, like raw is a bigger file and Filmora does support raw. Uh, it's a, but it, um, when you run raw footage in Filmora, um, it's not compressed. There's no H.264 added to it. So Filmora doesn't lag as much because it's not having to um, uncompress and read the compression that's been applied to the footage. So it's one of those funny things like you think raw are these huge files, but they actually run smoother on your video editing software because it, there's no compression that has to be read. <clears throat> so that's, um, uh, that's how I do it. Real simple. I tend to, my, my basic process goes like this, Toby, is, is I film on a camera. So like this very same camera that I'm live streaming with has a card in it. I'll film on it on, and I'll record my mic, whether it's this one or if I'm doing a shot, I have a more expensive Sennheiser mic up top here. That's, that one's a shotgun mic that can stay out of shot because it sounds good farther away. Um, and I'll just record audio to my computer and I'll just record the, video right on the camera and I'll just pull the SD card out, put it in the computer and I bring them both into like Filmora, Movavi or whatever and I just line them up. Um, one of the things, because usually you can just, I line up by sight, I can see the audio wave files from the camera mic and then the, other, the better mic track and I put them together. Another thing you can do is just clap. If, you ever, if you're ever recording audio, anyone out there, if you're ever recording audio like you want to get a better mic sound or something and you're recording to a different device, um, maybe, you're, maybe you've got your phone but you're, you know, you've got a, maybe a lapel mic, a lav mic going into a separate recorder. Um, a real simple trick is just clap. At the beginning, like when you start your footage, just and then all you have to do is even if your camera doesn't have a mic in it, where your hands come together, you look at the audio spikes from your, from your, from your audio file and line them up so the spike happens right where your hands clap together. And now your audio is in sync. It's a real easy way to sync up audio if you happen to record to a different device. Uh, is that Brian G. Johnson in the house? Brian G. Johnson, the godfather in the house. Good to see you, pal. Um, yeah, so... Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. What do we got going over here? What do you think of twin motion? I, what, what is twin motion? I don't even know what twin motion is. Uh, I'll have to look that up. You've got um, you've got you've got me by surprise here. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe you'll have to explain what what twin motion is so I can catch up. Yeah, you talk too fast. You're not the first person to tell me that. I also sit too close to the camera and I wave my hands around too much. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's, just, that's how I roll. Uh, let me just make sure I'm catching all these questions up here from private chat. There was um, there's a couple I missed from before. Um, uh, let me see if it, I'm making sure I didn't miss any. Uh, let's see. Did I miss? No, Blaine. Oh, I did. I miss Blaine super chat. I was chatting so much. Blaine, if I miss Blaine uh, Locklear, uh, $5 super chat. Hi, Dan. You're just saying hi. Thanks for the great inf info and value you provide. If I didn't read that one, I apologize. Keep it up. You're making a positive impact on the community and the platform. I appreciate that, Blaine. means a lot, my friend. All right, listen, I think we've gotten through most of the questions today. If you have any other questions and things we didn't cover, feel free to leave them in the comments below on the replay. Uh, and like I said, I'm going to be trying to get these shorter, and I'll be doing these like once a week so that we can catch up. You guys can come in, think about something that um, I haven't covered, and we can talk about it. Um, and, if, and if you think of something that you want me to cover in the next live stream, put it down in the comments section below if you're watching this on the replay or if you just happen to be here now. Um, and I'll make sure that on the next live chat that I'll, get so, I'll be prepared for it and I can grab some of the footage that I might need to show you you one of those techniques or tricks so we can get through some of that like we did with the scoreboard all right uh you guys have a great weekend enjoy the rest of your friday um uh and i'll talk to you guys soon peace